Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport, then this is the podcast for you. Today, we're with Michelle Mascalier, the former chairman of IMG Media, part of the largest sports management agency in the world. Michelle spent 35 years at the heart of the sports business, making his way up from intern to chairman. He's dealt with some of the most famous athletes in history, CEOs of blue chip companies, as well as some of the pioneers of the media industry. Michelle, hello and welcome to the podcast. Hello. Are you able to provide us with, with your own overview of, of your career before we get into the, the nitty gritty and the details? Of course. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be in the hand of the guru of the podcast, from what I understand. So uh, here I am. It makes me feel young because I know that the audience are student and, uh, and I remember very well my, my days when I was student. And I, and like I was struggling a little bit. Uh, I, I ultimately, from Belgium, I got a law degree. <clears throat> but you know, from the from the moment where I was kind of uh, hacking into this syllabus and, and trying to find, you know, what would be my future and where where was my career going to go go to, I had a, a lot of doubt, a lot of uh, what what my potential, what my talents were, what was my identity, where was my passion, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners have uh, have those issues as well, and and. And I'm very happy to uh, to share the moment where I struggle, uh, perhaps even more than the moment when I succeeded. Why? Because I think like a lot of people have um, a, a lot of talent, but those talents are often overlooked by a syst- system which is designed um, perhaps to provide a score and ranking rather than to highlight the potential of individual. And that's, I'm sure, in your university, this is where, you know, between the academic and the practice, this is where where you turn people's talent and potential into, you know, becoming rainmakers of tomorrow. But I did struggle in that context until, until I uh, basically during uni I was involved in a number of activities like organizing sports event on campus, the 24 hours of uh, of cycling or public speaking competition, or you name it. <coughs> Retrospectively, uh, when I remember those years, I felt like, well, that was who I was going to become. I was a promoter, not knowing I was a promoter. So ultimately, when I got my diploma, I said, okay, well, Belgium is not the environment where I'm going to thrive. Um, and then I said, well, where do I want to go? I was influenced by, you know, the culture, the pop culture of, of Britain, by the, by, the, by the BBC sports and everything. And I said, okay, I'm going to jump uh, the channel. And uh, even though I had no money, I couldn't speak a word of English. And uh, and then I said, well, I, I'm going to give it a shot. I haven't got much to lose. And whilst I was in England, I stood, start working for a, for a law firm as, as an intern and, uh, you know, no, no paid, but I wanted to speak English. And that was the best way to basically start, you know, creating context, getting a bit of confidence and, and, uh, and, and find my way until until I was very uh, fortunate and lucky that while I was reading the book All What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School for Mark McCormack, I realized that the firm I was working for uh, was the lawyer of, uh, of IMG, Mark McCormack's uh, uh, office in London. And then I put the one and two together and I've asked whether they would be um, uh, happy to sponsor or at least recommend me. And that was, that was the beginning of my career. This is when I got a job at IMG. I was an intern, and and then the next 30, 35 years, I went from intern to chairman. I, that's that's an that's an amazing start to a career, and I think we're going to dig into that further um, as we go along. Before we do move any further, um, for our regular listeners, I've got a new co-host with me today. So, Dr. Peter Dickinson is joining me. Peter, could you just give a brief overview of yourself for the listeners, please? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Martin, and welcome, Michelle. Yes, um, Peter Dickinson here. I'm a lecturer, which uh, is a different terminology in the UK. So for our US uh, audience, that would be an assistant professor in sport management. Um, I, I researched the, the commercial business side of sport, in particular, the sponsorship and the spillovers from there. Uh, and yes, uh, absolutely excited to be here to, to listen to Michelle's story. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Now, getting back to Michelle, because that sounds amazing. Um, I know you've written a book recently. This is not a dress rehearsal. Can you tell me what inspired you to write this book? 
A couple of things. The first thing is that you know I've been I've been fortunate all along my career, and um, I just wanted to give back. And uh, you know, when once once I exited, you know, the excitement of just saying, okay, now I'm not going to be suffocated by you know this crazy uh, uh, schedule. I was on the road 200 days a year, and uh, and and pulling out of the operation side of the business. You know, we've we've created the world's largest independent sports and and uh, sports management production media distribution and then um, and then I've just felt like oh my gosh now I gotta I gotta take time um, to do things that I really want to do not not knowing exactly which direction I would go but I just thought it would be a good idea to kind of share my experience and and when I see the spirit of giving back you know put in the context of the of education that would be something which would be a great challenge and and with the pandemic I had a bit of time on my hands we have a um, a, a refuge up in the mountain I now live in Switzerland and, you know, no water, electricity or, or certainly not heating. And then I just went up there and I took lots of paper and and, and pencil and, and wine and music and whatever. You, and I just said, I'm going to put together uh, authentic stories. And then all these authentic stories, I'm going to li- link them one with another and, uh, and kind of put together a series of advice which have helped me to uh, get the career I had. And I wanted to share that, simple as that, you know, no, no, nothing else. And uh, while writing it and while putting it together, I just felt like, you know, what would be the interesting angle, not like another business book. And I just say, well, it's the most valuable community on, 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 on earth and for, and for people, especially for people like me, like, you know, by definition, the older you get, the less time you have. And therefore the time is valuable. But at the same time, retrospectively, when I started my career, if I had been given a number of advice rather than discovering, you know, the reality of, of, of business by myself, it would have perhaps boosted my career. But back to the angle I wanted to give to the book is beyond beyond the how you can maximize your success story. To me, is how you balance your personal life, your personal ambition, and how you're gonna have a board in everything you try to approach together with a success career. So you don't sacrifice everything for the sake of success, whatever the definition of success is, money, title, performance, is medal, whatever it is, but you don't you don't sacrifice, you know there's so many reasons why you're on the planet and how you want to contribute and then how you want to socialize. So I thought that the book, this is not a dress rehearsal, meaning like we ha- we only have one shot at it, make the most of it and balance, you know, your, your, your personal ambition with your professional ambition. And and my journey is exactly that. And I, and I thought if somebody like me um, with no formal, you know, education in the Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, environment can succeed in England with no money, not speaking language, not a single contact when I started my career, then I just want to uh, hopefully inspire your listener that if I can do it, they can do it. Or they can self- certainly have a, a, a shot at it. You know, you have to believe in yourself. And then I think a lot of people have... Uh, have got talent and I hope that my story will inspire people to find their talent to find the the, the strength and the audacity to uh, to have a fun and successful career well, re- regular listeners might be um, shocked to discover that we actually do have a plan of what we're going to do in the podcast but I often go off piste and I really like a couple of pieces you've mentioned around kind of passion and finding your purpose so how do you feel you found your purpose okay so so on, on the first two or three component, when you know, I don't want to refer to the book too often, but because you mentioned it, like to me, you know, the, one of the first elements uh, which are key to uh, uh, define where your career is going to be is to find out who you are. You know, what is your identity? What do you mean? Are you a, a producer? Are you a guy who is a potential leader? Are you a guy who is a uh, a fantastic follower and attention to detail. Are you more like a, um, a free thinker, a rebel, like, like in my case? So you need to find a little bit where your identity is. That's the first element. Okay. So as I said earlier, on one of the element which composed, you know, the mosaic of my personality is well, I was a promoter and I was a creative promoter 
and I wanted to get into it. But I've I've discovered that all the way. I didn't wake up on one morning and say, I'm a promoter and that's gonna be my life at IMG. No, I mean that's that's the way how you start by you know morphing yourself into something which will become you know your your engine, your heart, your your brain, your guts, everything that goes with it to to um, uh, to drive your career. The second element which it's even probably more important and is, you know, what's your passion? Because I'm sorry to say that you can be a, a brainy guy with, with no passion, you're not going to get anywhere. People need to smell and feel that you have fire in yourself and that you prepare to just like, you know, break every barriers and uh, and and your passion is what is going to drive everything and everywhere. You know, still now today, after so many years, I still have passion to do so many things with my life and you communicate that with you and the people around you will will join and jump on your boat if you are uh, the, the the one who just basically feel like this is what I want to do with my life my my, my life and and uh, one way or another I'll succeed I don't know how and that's exactly how I started my career when my first job when I sorry when I applied at IMG that's exactly what people smell in me I did say I went to this interview I say this is the company I want to work for this is the profile this is me as a as a as a promoter you know the train is not going to stop a second time in that station I, I better make sure I jump in it and in my interview I know I I, I broke I broke the um, um, come at the eyes by saying listen I I I want this job and I'm going to work for free and you're going to pay me when I'm going to start making some money. And then the guy smiled at me and said, okay, well, never had that before. Maybe we'll have a we'll have a shot at it. So passion is absolutely key in this process. Peter? Yeah, it's interesting that you were saying that, Michelle, because I, I understand you don't want to reference the book too much, but I do find there's something quite interesting in the, in the book that you say when you talk about diversity and the X factor there. So... The passion and everything is brilliant. Everyone was needing that as, as I understood it. But also you were looking for things different as well. If there were people in the equivalent of where you were at the start of your career or just as they were working up into the industry, you were looking for people that had that passion, but, but also difference too. Absolutely. The first two elements, you know, when I referring to identity and passion, I absolutely agree. Without that, I don't know where you're going to go. But then if you put the next floor to that is what's your X factor? I mean, I've interviewed, as you can imagine, I've, I've built up a team of a thousand people approximately. So I've interviewed people left, right and center. And of course, now you have the kind of the HR environment and how people analyze your characters. In in my days, it was a little bit more, um, how can I say, uh, uh, spontaneous, if I can use that word. but. Every single time somebody walked into my office, I was trying to detect, you know, what's the X factor. And for whoever is going to be, you know, one day get their diploma and they're going to apply for their first job or at any stage of the progression of their career, they need to appreciate the fact that before them, there are 10 people who apply for the job and after them, there'll be another 10 people. So why you? Why do you fit in my organization? Where is it that you're going to be loved and appreciated and respected by your client and your customers? Where is it that you're going to be a transformer, a rainmaker? You're going to be part of a of a of a of an organization and bring your component so the organization is going to be better than the the competitors. So all these elements I try to detect, and it could be like you know the person who is very confident, very social, very um, how can I say speak the languages or who have done a lot of uh, paracurricular activities when you walk into an interview if you don't have this feeling like you know I'm gonna kill and it's gonna be me and nobody else because of this 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 and that then you not sure I'm not saying you're not gonna get the job I'm just saying you you handicap yourself so the element of X factor when you apply for a job or when you grow your career it is something like you know I, I just keep telling you, what's your X factor? Why? Same thing with the client. Same thing with the customer. Why do you want to partner with that organization? Why is it that these guys uh, need to be uh, uh, working with it? What is it that we can do by ourselves? And oh, those guys are very good at this. They're very unique at that. And think about that. That's X factor is definitely an absolute key comp component in in the range of talent potential and success secret, to, so to speak. And, and so the, if I understand what you're saying there correctly, there's an element of turning a disadvantage into an advantage by finding your unique element in the team or being able to put something forward that you know you have 
that other, others might not. In the same way, I guess, you came over to England not speaking English, um, but also then been able to work your way up through the legal side and then doing the sales side too. Sure. I mean, that, that's that been uh, one illustration. And, and you're right to say that a lot of people who start with some form of, of, of a handicap, you know, they are angry or hungry to overcome that and develop other form of talents. And and but even besides that, if everybody starts on the sequel chance and, and, uh, and no discrimination from one to another, you still need an X factor somewhere which just say, okay, why you? And then and then it says, well, you need to sell yourself in a way which is which is creative. Make people, uh, as I said, I, there are two criteria I've often used when when I was then telling my team, you know, when they're gonna hire the people, just find people who are gonna be loved and respected. I mean, to me, these are the two. I mean, I, I respect very much anything which to do with academic intelligence, but there are two other organs in your body which are equally important: is your heart and your guts. And in a thinking with your heart and, and and behaving with your guts are equally important that to, to to be dealing with brain individual. My uh, my main role at the, at the university is applied learning, and a lot of the things you've mentioned there, I talk to with the students quite a lot. So I link some of the academic learning through my lectures and my modules, but also with the volunteering side. And I often say to students, look, let's be honest, having a degree is the start. You know that may get you through the door. Adding experience to that degree will open that door even more and give you more potential. However, I've interviewed many people, probably not as many as you, Michelle, but I've interviewed a lot as a, as a head of department and, and the rest of it. And it's passion and that purpose that gets people the job once they're in that door. And it's really interesting because very rarely for me has the best CV been the person that ends up getting the job. And it's, it's amazing the people that walk in the door and you might have the person who's just scraped into the interview, but then the passion and personality shines through and they become the person who's going to get that job. That's that's why the internship is so good. I mean, we we had uh, like many organizations, like they have a, a lot of internship, and then you test people to the reality. But let's be absolutely um, aware uh, to the fact that, like you rightly uh, highlighted, is experience is is where you really going to see you know the proper talent. And and let's not be too um, how can I say uh, frustrated when when you are a, a, a new learner just say oh I don't have the confidence. That I don't have the experience, of course, but every expert, every expert was once a beginner, right? Okay, by definition. So don't don't suffocate yourself because you're lacking the confidence and the experience. Everybody is going through the same process, and that's why you have this internship, and that's where your personality starts shining. And 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 assorted to that, I would say that if you don't believe in yourself, no one will do it for you. No one will be successful for you. So it is you and the reality. So academics, very good. This is where you shine. You get your grade. Perfect. You learn quite a lot. And then you move into practice. And when the two, it's not like one day you're an academic and the other day you, the, the two are coming. And, and the more you can get while you are at uni or wherever, experiences where there's holidays or here and there. So it's, as I mentioned in the book, you know, get on the dance floor as early as you can. You know, don't wait for the party to warm up. Just get on the dance floor, be the first one. Learn, learn, learn. Make contact, you know, develop a name for yourself, develop relationship, develop an understanding, observe aggressively. Why? Because you will develop you know, on the back of yourself an understanding of a situation which will allow you to anticipate and then when you're a good anticipator i can guarantee you're going to be a successful person it's it echoes so many of the things that i talk to the students about it's great to hear you know from yourself who's been very 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 successful in in taking these ideas and, and turning them into practice so from that intern perspective of where your career began how did you move from you know we probably don't need a, a description of every single job and every single promotion but you know were there some specific things that stood out from you going from intern into that first paid role and then how did that journey transpire into where you ended up right i'll try to be concise because in, in, indeed you know to, to to summarize 35 years in in a, in a couple of minutes it's going to be a bit challenging but i remember the years and the days uh, when it was just the beginning and i was you know reading contract meeting people you know 
spending time at the pub after the hours and try to understand how things were. And once you understand your environment a little bit, then just say, okay, what am I? I'm a promoter. I'm a sales guy. I think I was I was good in sales. So I kind of realized very quickly that if you generate revenue, you're going to be more respected. Like, you know, if you were doing other things, no, no discredit to the other talents who are the component of the organization. But I, that's what my, my journey was. I felt like, okay, I'm a salesman. Give me stuff to sell. And it was sponsorship and it was endorsement. It was patched on the shoulder of a golfer uh, or, or a tennis man. And then uh, uh, to bring sponsors to, uh, um, you know, whatever sports sports event. And every time I was bringing a sponsor and I just felt like, okay, well, you know, if I speak French and 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 I'm going to go and find sponsors in, in the area where perhaps I will develop relationship faster than people who don't speak the other languages and so on. So that was the beginning of me becoming a salesperson. And I got paid accordingly because I was making money. So I just said, listen, it's only fair. I'm, I don't want to uh, uh, to leverage my position, but, you know, give me a deal. You know, do you want me to sell 100,000 or a million and how much I get if I did? And that was the deal. I was no sales commission as such, but that was incentive program. And then I went from, you know, being a salesman to, uh, uh, to be part of various organizations. They needed at some stage someone who would be the representative of IMG in a consulting agreement in the win- in the context of the Winter Olympic Games, Albertville 1992. Again, French speaking, French education, or Belgium French uh, education. I went there and I spent a year, um, you know, working with the world's largest uh, institution in France, and whether it's the governing bodies and or some top sponsors, which part of the program, we generated more revenue for the Winter Olympic Games and the Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles before. So the success story was fantastic. And this is now how I start getting like, I say, mm, wow, you know, there's nobody I can't talk to. There's nothing I can't do. I mean, I can sell big package or small packages. And and then you look at what's happened to the Olympics and then you, it gives you wing. You Everybody is, 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 um, uh, was born with wing in its back, but maybe you don't realize. It's like the bird the first time he fly over the, of, of his nest. Is he going to crash landing? Is he going to do a soft landing? Or or is he going to overtake all the other trees around him? And and only when you flap those that you realize that, well, actually, I can go beyond, beyond higher and, and faster and further. And that's that was my journey, really, from one uh, opportunity to another. I kind of felt like, Maybe I was lucky, like to be at the right place at the right time, um, but I think also that you create your own luck, the premises of your own luck, and I, and again in the process you build up relationship and you you put your name forward. So after the Olympics, I had the opportunity to open an office, and then I went to McCormack and IMG and just say, hey, listen, Brussels, 1992, that's where I'm from. Maybe you you need an office, so I've opened an office there, and I became a promoter of various events. Then I get uh, part of the European Sales Group, and then it was the uh, um, it was the explosion. Te- the technology allowed the explosion of pay TV, and then for, from from that, it was a big breakthrough for me because I could I could see and smell and feel that selling content, live content, you know, media, media, uh, media sales distribution would be the next uh, financial uh, explosion, and we will put IMG in a, in a position. Uh, ahead of any of the competitors. You know, we had offices around the world. We had sales guys everywhere. We were, uh, you know, manage, managing athletes, personality, and so on. But now, getting involved into the, the, the world of media, that will be the next segment of revenue in this equation of sports management. And then I went head head on into that. And um, and from uh, a media sales, I become head of sales Europe, and then head of sales worldwide, and then uh, and then I became president of IMG Media and ultimately chairman of events and media. So boom, I just like yeah, if 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 the first ten years were about that, the next twenty years was my media career. So what was the business model? It was pretty simple. I mean, simple retrospectively is like you know you go to all these uh, the likes of uh, Sky or Canal Plus and others, and you say well. I have uh, this programming in golf, in tennis, in motor racing, in rugby, and then we were doing packages. And uh, and my my view wa- was that if we were going to be able to be the biggest aggregator of uh, content, being the middleman between, let's say, Wimbledon and 
the BBC or and and take, taking a cut, uh, a commission on each of the transaction. The next level would be like, okay, where well, we're going to sell you golf, we're going to sell you tennis, we're going to sell you uh, badminton, we're going to sell you motor racing, and do these so-called packages. That would be uh, putting us in a in a very very unique position and that's exactly what we did you know we we became the world largest independent aggregator of content and then uh, and then from there there was virtually no limit to what we could not do because we could go to any governing body and just saying listen I am yeah, I mean I've, we've opened like something like 30 offices around the world in a few years we knew exactly wherever we were in the world what the value of media rights was and how to maximize the revenue so every organization governing body we went to, we were the expert and respected, and we were generating much more money than they were anticipating, and we're generating a lot of money for ourselves. So that that was like my my brokerage year. Uh, let's say I would say the second the second decade of my career, and then uh, and then moving on to the third one, it was of a slightly different uh, dimension. Why? Because McCormack passed away. Uh, the IMG uh, organization has been sold to uh, private equity. The private equity firm came into the equation, and it was no longer client servicing. It was about what's the value of the business. You know, what do you contribute in the equity of the value? What is your stock in the business? And okay, again, being at the right time at the right place, you know, I was I was managing number one profit uh, center, and and the private equity guy just said, okay, well, we're going to do a deal with you. You're gonna you're gonna be an owner, but you're gonna have to deliver. Say, well, bring it on, baby. You know, that's exactly what I like. I've done all that my career. Give me a new challenge. And uh, and then I became like more like an equity person, still using the business model, but creating wealth and value in everything I was doing. Not only returning clients uh, 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 money and taking a cut. No, I was creating uh, value and wealth for IMG, which has been sold originally for $750 million. Then it's been sold uh, for the second generation of $2.4 billion to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the group now called Endeavor, which is the, the merge between WME and IMG. And then uh, and now this, this business went public and is valued at $10, $10 billion. So the, the, the last decade for me was more like, well, I became president of IMG uh, Media and then uh, we grew the business along the line of of what I've, uh, I've described to you. It's an even more incredible journey when you when you give those details. Um, I've got two two probably points uh, to pick up on. One, you very briefly mentioned there, formal and informal, right at the start of 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 the of the talk and of your journey. Can you just go into a little bit more? You mentioned going to the pub and like, where do you feel these roles of the formal and informal help develop you? Very blurred. I'm not a formal person. I can I can promise you that. I, I mean, I, I have to respect rules, but I'm much better in bending them or creating my own one. And uh, and that is definitely something which I believe is helping you to kind of forge your way to the future. Why? And again, you have to put things in perspective. There was then, and this is now. And I'm not saying that what was happening then and all the advice I'm giving needs to be applied strictly to censor and, and, and it could apply now. But I'm saying is that we were pioneer. There was no rules. You know, we were inventing business model. You know, we were creating, you know, this idea. And when when we were getting together with my senior management team, I say, guys, you know, let's 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 be clever, let's be creative, let's do things like nobody has done that be- before. And where where is formality versus informality in that context? Well, to me, it was more like a lifestyle. I've always lived the lifestyle, which is the one which I want to be the captain of my life. I want I want to drive my future. And then when I was at, at the helm of a business, the spirit of um, creativity, innovation, uh, endeavoring were the one which were giving me the fuel that I needed rather than what are the rules? No, we write the rules. We don't follow the rules. We create. We create the business of tomorrow. Now, different today, but still the spirit would remain the same. 
I, I agree with you that to, to an extent different today, but th- people have still got to, you know, students who are listening, you still got to break the rules, but obviously within boundaries, don't, don't go breaking rules I've made, of course. Sure. Um, <laughs> but with that, with that kind of formal informal, you know, I teach students around the meeting that happens, the formal meeting happens, but a lot of the decisions are actually made in this informal space over here and these meetings outside meetings. And just, I, I wonder with this, flexible working and obviously we're on teams now i wonder where this informal piece is going to end up in the next few years and whether that whether people start to understand how important that informal piece still is i mean you're right that the technology and everything that we're currently doing you know we, we we can create miracle and the digital age is allowing us a lot of new business model but you know being a little bit old school myself i still value the human being way beyond artificial intelligence and anything else and and when i was uh, you know uh, walking before i was trotting and then running and galloping i was i was the guy who was spending my time in informal area you know whether it's the pub after dinner or whether you know i had i had the uh, a piece of paper which what which was divided in three area right call and do. And I just say, okay, now how am I going to build and create an environment for me in a structured way? So write to so-and-so, call so-and-so, go and play golf or tennis with so-and-so, or go on at the weekend here and there, go hiking with X, Y, and Z. And I was kind of building this kind of, uh, you know, after hours uh, uh, activities. Why? Because we are in a, in a human being environment. We're in a people's business. And regardless of any technology etc i can promise you that you know the spirit of being in a people's business whether it's through zoom or or, or with a with a drink after hours is an absolutely key component to make people appreciate who you are what you can do how you can contribute and that's to me has been always very important so the 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 social side of things i would not maybe specifically divided formal and the social side of it, for me, it was work. It was making no difference whether it was within the eight o'clock in the morning till the six o'clock at night. No, it makes no difference. We can. I mean, we had an, an average of seven to eight events a day to manage. So I could start my day at being at eight different places. And yet, you know, and that's before the day start. It's just like to be present and shake hands with my, with my clients and customers. So you have to develop a uh, kind of an understanding on how you will be uh, uh, managing people, uh, doing your admin and being proactively socializing with your with, with your clients. All this is something that you will adapt to the to the to the situation. But it is possible. I mean, you know, that's my journey. It's, it's very possible. Well, you, you've touched upon there, you know what, I, I don't like the term, just probably because how it's uh, been developed, but you touched upon networking there. Um, I, I'd probably prefer to call it building relationships. Um, and I think networking, to some extent, has become... It's become not what I feel it is. So you can you talk us about networking? Were you, were you proactive in trying to actively network with certain people or organizations? Yeah, uh, at, at all level, because as I said, you know, I started from zero, absolutely zero. Could not even engage in the conversation until a couple of weeks when I and then uh, <coughs> and then effectively you just kind of need to understand your environment. How are you going to do it? I mean, you talk to the to your peers, you talk to your superiors, you talk to your clients, and 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 with all that, you develop relationship. You want people to appreciate who you are. What's your X factor? And then from there, you know, you create kind of a snowball effect. The word networking, uh, you know, which which has perhaps the connotation like you only are interested in a certain type of person because of what these people can bring to your business. To me, it's not like at all. And, and I'm giving a lot of advice in the book, like, you know, when when you grow and you com- accompany people on the way up, you know, if and when the people that you have been networking with for one reason or another fall, they're no longer the, the powerful people that need, you accompany them on the way down. And and that is still part of my definition of networking, but that's to me, uh, it's more like the social environment where, where we were. Being in a people's business, you just have to, you, know, you have to know and, and people around the world and you want to make sure that the people appreciate who you are. And when you're a manager, you want to be loved and respected by your employee 
all that is part of the same equation. And uh, and still now today, I don't need anyone, you know, specifically to do to do a business whatsoever. But I spend a significant amount of my time, you know, reaching out to people, having a chat, sending Christmas card. Uh, uh, you know, the, the podcast is a, is a very good example. I don't know, you have 10, 20, 30,000 people listening to you. I mean, that, that's networking as far as I'm concerned, and I enjoy it very much. And, and you know, speaking and engaging with the next generation, the, the youth is 25% of the population, 100% of our future. The time today that I spend, you know, through this technology and reaching out to so many people, I'm sure this is, you know, a, a, a part of the process, and it makes me feel very good if I can touch people's life and helping people in the in their future. Yes, it is still networking, but, you know, with, with a person. Purpose. And I'm aware, uh, Michelle, that, you know, you, you talk again in your book about believing people are inherently good. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering that philosophy, obviously not naming any names, how, how that's, you know, for, for, for better or worse, that that's played out in, in your career and, and what learning you could give around that. Well, I mean, it started because before I was at uni, I was, a, I would not say a write-off, but, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't good. I wasn't shining as a student, but yet in my, in my environment, people did like me. And then I was kind of, could not understand why my teacher thought I was a loser and my friend thought I was a leader. And, you know, and there was all sort of little things I was doing on the side, understanding appreciating and again retrospectively uh, you know that you, you have a lot of people with a lot of talent but the system in which we are um, guiding the uh, an education process perhaps is overlooked what the real talents of people are and they will blossom at the later stage in their career somewhere else maybe not in an academic side and if you are addressing uh, some sort of a, a, a dialogue with somebody who doesn't think he has the potential is because perhaps people haven't seen the potential in him and not himself either and that's that's basically having lived that side of uh, frustration in the beginning of my career, that when I hire people, when I try to build organization, I, I tend to be a, a positive thinker. I'm, I'm a possibilist ab above everything. And I see the potential and, and the solution before seeing what is the reason why an idea might be a bad idea. And that's all what I'm trying to say here. And how have you helped? So you, men you mentioned employees. How have you helped uh, employees kind of find that within them and, and helped develop them? Or have you had others throughout your career who've helped you in developing that? Sure, I mean, I was inspired by a lot of people. Yeah, the people who had faith in me, they trusted me, and then suddenly it gives me confidence. A lot of things comes with confidence. And uh, and and I'm not sure there is a rule book. I'm not, not a psychiatrist, far from that. And a, a lot of my behavior is driven by my kind of more like emotional intelligence more than anything else. But I know that I'm one creating a team, I have the ability to sense, you know, where people's potential are, whether it's going to materialize and it's a different story. But then we create that, you know, that, that spirit, that reflection. And as a team, it's one for all and all for one. And and we win or we, or we lose together. And that's that's the name and reputation that I've developed by, you know, going forward. That doesn't mean that everybody became heroes and certainly very few as heroes. But I, I believe that finding people's talent is is a skill and, and that's something that a manager should have rather than being more uh, Cartesian or pragmatic. It says, yes, no, good, not good. What's, what's your score? Yeah, you're part of the team, you're not part of the team. Yes, we're all in a hurry to do many things. Things, but at the same time, I, um, I, I like I like to give people a chance. The information you're giving us is just brilliant for for all our students, and I'm aware that um, we, we're going to start running out of time. So I've probably got a few more questions that people would like to know from you. One being. Whilst at IMG, what is your favorite experience of IMG? Because it sounds like you've had an unbelievable career. So what was the best thing, the most memorable thing for you? 
um, generally speaking, I felt like working for an international organization and working in something which, you know, I can, when you read the paper, you see what you've been doing and or you switch your TV on and you see your, your, your event or your client. To me, joining Angie was like seeing the world. And every time I had the opportunity to engage in new challenges, uh, this, these are the various bollards I, I, I kind of remember in terms of fantastic experience. The Olympics, I love the Olympics in general. But they have the privilege to go and work for uh, for the Jean Claude Kelly organization at the time, and 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 organ- be part of the financial organization of the Winter Olympic Games is definitely, especially very early in my career. Uh, later on, I became a, kind of a media consultant for the IOC, so I was going to each of these Olympics. But if I want to look at something a little bit specific, it was a big challenge. That was at the time when Murdoch became, um, I mean, started his business of of pay TV in Asia and in. China in particular, and I went on a on a kind of a mission to kind of do a deal between the Chinese Football Association and and the and the Murdoch infrastructure at the time. And I had to broker the deal. I mean, the idea was that we're going to be uh, producing two football match a week, in addition of what CCTV had for state television, and 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 that was the business model, the the financial idea that we had, and we were going to be selling on a pay TV. But you know, um, going into China and and organizing to have two football match produced per week and brokering that you know with a with an with a capitalist institution is has been another challenge. It was it had a certain degree of success, not not tremendous one, but to me you learn more by challenges and occasionally by defeat or by by losing uh, or, or failing than than systematically uh, uh, winning everything you touch. So to me, it's not a question of uh, uh, succeeding or failing. It's a, it's a question of, of trying. And to answer your question, the opportunity that I've had to try and to attempt uh, on creating new businesses anywhere around the world is is what I take from my from my my 35 years journey in this this organization obviously you've had loads of you know you've, you've mentioned three or four successes there and you, you touched upon failure a little bit um, so if you had your time again at IMG what would, is there anything you would do differently the, the conclusion to that question first of all is to say like you can't live with any regret what is past is past but you learn from things what would I like to do again? Uh, to me, I've, I've been so fortunate that I kind of retrospectively try to bring what is the definition of, of contentment or, or happiness. And rather than looking at what is the end game, you know, how much money do you want to have? I mean, how much money are you going to put in your coffin when you're going to die? You know, how many models? M- m- uh, medal you want to have on you. That's not, for me, it's not what I want to do. It's, what I want to do is carpe diem, seize the day, enjoy the moment. So at the beginning of my career, I wanted to enjoy the moment and gosh, did I do that? Yes. And I've done that all the way. So, you know, when I go back, would I have done, done things? If I've been laughing every morning and, and, and attempting to do, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Happiness is not not the destination. Would I have done it differently? Well, if if I, <laughs> I don't want to sound arrogant, but if I read the book all the day, <laughs> uh, you know, this is not a dress rehearsal. At the beginning of my career, maybe I would have speeded up the process. Um, you know, time is extremely valuable and maybe I've wasted a bit of time here and there. I would have been able to speak more languages. You know, I would have done, I, I am so hungry of, of doing things and stuff so many things. To answer your question, I don't want to avoid, would I have done things differently? I would have used my time better. I, I do have one question, Michelle, if you, if you don't mind. and it, it kind of ties in this idea about doing things differently, maybe. Um, failure, learning from it, vision that you talked about and driving the market. And, and I'm wondering if you could let the listeners know, because it will actually be not just our students, it'll be alumni and others that will be listening to this podcast. And then those people who are starting their journey in industry will make mistakes, um, will 
probably be asked by their older generation bosses and um, what they think about something in terms of technology. So I'm just interested if you you could let the listeners know about um, essentially Bake Off and Strictly Come Dancing or Dancing with the Stars and and the idea of how a vision of something maybe does materialize but not in in the the immediate future. You're right to point out today that in the in the media industry coming from the sports industry today the fight is about eyeball. It's not like you know, yes you want to you bring your fan, your sports fan, but while we were growing in so many different directions, Angie uh, were kind of saying, well, we, we're pretty good at sports, but, you know, how can we branch out and go to other uh, area? And and I've started a division called Feature and Entertainment at the time, and we started producing documentaries, and that was kind of nice, but, you know, not not going for the big license fee for the lives, you know, live event. So we had these uh, meetings on a regular basis by by, you know, getting the, the guru, the expert, and Mark McCormack was very keen to attend those meetings, and, and he was driving some of them, and uh, he was one day pretty late at, at Bay Hill, where, where, where he was close to where he was living, and then uh, it was late in the night, we were all jet-lagged, and there was a long agenda, and, and he came up with a number of ideas and suggestions, and we were all falling on, on top of each other, and, it's, and then he came up with the first idea, said, okay, we're going to give, let's say, six contestants with the same amount of butter and salt and pepper and food and ingredient and they're going to have a certain time and they're going to have to cook a meal and then the panel will come up and uh, and decide who's cooked the best meal and we were all looking at each other as he said omg the, the old man is losing it seriously he's losing it well probably 20 years ahead of his time he came up with the format you just mentioned and then in the same meeting he came up with another one he said well you know, we have sport. Why, why can't we turn dance into sports? And we have a dance. There is a dancing federation, and and then we we're gonna apply the business model of management of of sports into dancing. And again, says, oh my God! Like now, we have to tell him, like you know, listen, it's not gonna work, Mark. So we kill from the inventor of sports management. You know, two. <laughs> Two format, which probably among amongst the best ever format. So, what's the conclusion to that? Is like you know, every idea needs to be listened to, and certainly listen to your boss, even even or your teacher, even if if you think like he's losing his biscuit. <laughs> I, I think there are those two those two stories are amazing. I know Peter was really keen on getting those in, and they are fantastic stories about about you know about about failure, I suppose. Yeah, well, on our part, for sure. <laughs> we were the future. We were the one, you know, telling telling the boss, you know, where to invest his money and what to do. And, and effectively, you know, we killed we killed two genius ideas, uh, you know, which which materialized like many other other formats. And, and that's basically where today, you know, as I said, you know, I'm taking another example now, which is uh, in, in, in the gaming gaming business, not the betting, the, the video gaming industry. And then uh, I, I want wanted to uh, to put my hands in this business you know the volume of stream is incredible the number of people who are just you know absolutely passionately devoting time and there's no proper structure like a, an international federation so with a bunch of people uh, that I reached out from the outside who were expert and and my guy from the inside we created a team and then I've convinced the private equity firm to invest some money in, in creating or, or developing a, a concept called Major League Gaming, the MLG. And then we were we were convinced, like, okay, well, if it's one dollar a month per player, I just said, oh, well, that's going to be bigger than AMG. I mean, they were going to triple the, the equity value. And we went straight into that. And and I put my hand up. It was my idea. I was driving it, and I totally fucked up. <laughs> it sounds like a great idea. I mean, to be honest, it's still. Now it sounds like a great idea. People are still trying, but this is this is a wild west that industry. That's, that's interesting. Michelle, we're going to start drawing towards a close now. And, and I've, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. I, I hope, and I'm sure everybody listening hopes, that they can have such a smile on their face at towards the back end, towards the end of their career, reflecting on it like you have. So just to kind of conclude, what advice would you give to, to our students now who are looking at starting off in their career so that when they're reflecting on their career, they have a smile on their face like you have now. 
I would say uh, no one will be successful for you. So you, you want to have uh, the fire in you. You have to believe in yourself. You want to be uh, basically uh, uh, dr driving your career with what I said at the beginning of this conversation, balancing your personal emotion and well-being with your appetite to succeed. Because if you don't succeed by yourself, no one is going to do it for you. Very concise, very clear, um, and hopefully very good advice that our students can take on board with them. Um, Michelle, I could speak to you all day. I just want to thank you for, for coming on. My great pleasure. I mean, you guys are very communicative and I really enjoy our interaction. So I look forward to develop a relationship um, after hours, as you like to say. Thanks for listening to Experts in Sport. If you'd like to get in touch to discuss any topics that you'd like to hear about, then contact me, Martin Foster, via my email m.foster at albera.ac.uk. Bye for now. See you next time.